Next, we have Violet Batat, um, Shin DC board member, and she's going to speak about Violet's namesake, surviving the Farhud in Iraq. Hello, my name is Violet Batat, and I'm here to tell you my personal story, my family's personal story of the Farhud in Iraq. The legend of the Jews in Iraq is that the Jews had been there since the Babylonian exile after the destruction of the temple in 586 BC. It is our family tradition that this is when our family came as well. And at the very least, we can trace our family back to my great ancestor, Machua, in 1660. His grandson, Ezekiel, began using the last name Batat. The name Batat is said to have been originating from the words bat, house, and tat, the sound a duck makes. Ezekiel apparently had a big duck pond, and people would say they were heading to the house of ducks. If you meet anyone else with the last name Batat, we are all related and we all own a Batat book and can trace our relationship to each other. My grandfather grew up at what would turn out to be the end of the Jewish prominence in Baghdad after such a long history. Growing up, my grandfather was born into one of the best times for Jews in Iraq. Under the British mandate, they were treated as equal citizens and had the opportunity to participate in the government, as did Sir Sasan Cheskel, who was Iraq's first minister of finance. My grandfather spent his days attending Jewish day school, riding horses to the family compound just outside the city, being doted on by his grandmothers and dozens of aunts, and causing mischief with all his cousins. He told my family colorful stories from his boyhood days at the souk, the market, of Baghdad until the end of his life. However, there were some early indicators. At school, my grandfather was one of the stronger boys in his class, and he would escort the younger children home from school who were often picked on by other kids, kids who had gathered specifically to mock the Jewish children walking home. My grandfather pride, always prided himself on his studies and loved Arabic poetry, but despite his academic passions and stellar grades, he was unable to attend university at the end of his studies. There was a quota on the number of Jews allowed to be attend the universities. By the time of his graduation, his father had died and the family did not have the money to bribe the Iraqi officials into granting him one of those coveted spots at the university. While Britain had set up the Iraqi government, nationals, nationalists in Iraq wished to gain further independence from the British. Leading up to World War II, the Germans took advantage of this to sow chaos. Mein Kampf was translated into Arabic, the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem moved to Baghdad in 1939, and in 1941, his infamous meeting with Hitler to discuss how to overthrow the Jewish enemy. The Al-Fatwa Youth was developed to mi mimic the Hitler Jugend, and all teachers and students, including the Jews, were required to join in the anti-Semitic propaganda. On April 1st, 1941, the Iraqi Prime Minister, Rashid Ali, led a coup to overthrow all the pro-British government officials and declared loyalty to Germany. He denied the British fuel for their planes, and the British responded. By the end of May, they had de defeated this revolt to advance just outside of Baghdad. But inside the city, a political vacuum left extremists an opening to vent their anger in a final stand targeting their Jewish neighbors. This is a very brief overview of the history of Iraq and the Farhud. I would just like to acknowledge that we have someone in here who has dedicated their life to this research and, ad and advancing this. Uh, Mr. Maurice Shohed, if you don't mind standing up, just so I can acknowledge the fact that you have dedicated your life to this story. And if you have any other questions, he's the person to see. <laughs> um, so the day before the British entered was the holiday of Shavuot. Jews were on their way home from prayers, and my grandfather was walking down the street to pick up his little brother from a friend's house. He was identified as being a Jew and was chased by mobsters. He entered the building and tried to run and hide, but they followed him inside, stabbed him in the back, stabbed him in the back, and flung him from, from the third story of the building. And he was one of the lucky ones. That night, hundreds of Jews were killed, thousands injured and raped, businesses looted, and my grandfather lay bleeding on the ground the entire night. 
The next day, the British Army entered the city and the killing stopped, but by that time, my grandfather was so far gone that he was left for dead. By all probabilities, that should have been the end of this story and the end of his line. My grandfather, my father, and myself have, were saved only by the sheer luck that his sister and my namesake, Violet, was a nurse at the hospital that he was brought to. She recognized him among the dead. When she hugged him, she realized he still had a pulse and decided she could bring him back. My grandfather married, had two sons, seven grandchildren, and now four great-grandchildren. I stand as a memory to the amazing great aunt who saved my grandfather, Reuben, and my son, little Reuben, is a continuation of his legacy. That is the real loss of every story we have heard today. There are entire families that were wiped out with no one to tell their stories. No one to remember the horrors and to retell their stories to future generations. For that reason, I would like to ask the Holocaust survivor speakers who have spoken earlier today to come up and light, the can light a candle. And in doing so, I would ask all of you to join us in bearing the responsibility for carrying on their light and their stories. <laughs> 